This is the Edexcel GCSE 9 to 1 Maths Higher Paper 3 from the November 2023 series and this paper is a calculated paper. Question number 1, part A. Write 468,000 in standard form. So I've got this 468,000. I've got the decimal point here and I need to move this decimal point 1, 2, 3, 4, five places to the left leaving me with 4.68 times 10 to the 5 part b write 5.037 times 10 to the minus 4 as an ordinary number well i've got this 5.037 and i need to move this decimal point one two three four places to the left so I'm left with 0 0.0005037 as stated here. Question number two here is a biased spinner. The table shows the probabilities that when the spinner is spun it will land on A, on B, on C and on D and that's shown in this table here. Luca will spin the spinner 200 times. You have to work out an estimate for the number of times the spinner will land on A. The probability that the spinner will land on A is 0.4. Hence, we have 200 multiplied by 0.4, which is 80. So we estimate that the spinner will land on the letter A 80 times. Question number three. Sideo works at a weather station. The table gives information about the temperature T degree C at midday for each of 50 cities in the UK on Tuesday. For part A, we have to calculate an estimate for the mean temperature. The first thing we can do is find the midpoint of each of these intervals. Midpoint of 10 and 15 is 12.5. Midpoint of 15 and 20 is 17.5. Midpoint of 20 and 25 is 22.5. Midpoint of 25 and 30 is 27.5. Midpoint of 30 and 35 is 32.5. We now are required to find the midpoint multiplied by the frequency. 12.5 multiplied by 2 is 25. 17.5 multiplied by 8 is 140. 22.5 multiplied by 13 is 292.5. 27.5 multiplied by 21 is 577.5. 32.5 multiplied by 6 is 195. If we add together all of the frequencies, 2 plus 8 plus 13 plus 21 plus 6, we get 50. And now we need to add together the values shown here. So 25 plus 140 plus 292.5 plus 577.5 plus 195, that's 1,230. We would have to do 1230 divided by 50. So if I divide this value by 50, we get 24.6. So the mean is 24.6 degrees. Saija says the median temperature is 22.5 degrees C because 22.5 is the middle number in the middle group. Part B. Is Saja correct? Give a reason for your answer. We have 50 pieces of data, so if I do 50 divided by 2, I get 25. I am required to find the 25th value. Now, if I think about the cumulative frequencies, we start off with 2, adding 8 to that gives 10, adding 13 to that gives 23, and therefore, the median will lie in this interval here because the 20 
fifth value is found here by adding the 23 plus the 21. So, Saija is incorrect because the median is in the interval 25, which is less than t, which is less than 30. Question number four. Jenna is asked to show the inequality negative three, which is less than x, which is less than or equal to four on a number line. Here is her answer. Part A, write down two mistakes Jenna has made. First of all, we've got a less than or equal to 4, and here what we are showing is less than 4. So for us to show less than or equal to 4, we should have filled in the circle at 4. The next thing, we are going from negative 3 to 4, here we are going from negative 2 to 4. So she should start at negative 3, not negative 2. Part B, work out the greatest integer that satisfies the inequality. 5y subtract 7 is less than 16. If I add 7 to both sides, we end up with 5y being less than 23. And if I divide both sides by 5, y is less than 4.6. So the greatest integer that satisfies this inequality is 4. Because y is less than 4.6 and the closest integer that satisfies this will therefore be 4. Question number 5. Ali buys packs of balloons and boxes of pencils. There are 30 balloons in each pack. There are 24 pencils in each box. Ali buys exactly the same number of balloons and pencils. Work out how many packs of balloons and how many boxes of pencils she could have bought. You must show all your working. What we need to do is find out the lowest common multiple of 30 and 24. This will make the number of balloons equal the number of pencils. And from that, we can find out how many packs of balloons we need and how many boxes of pencils we need. So for balloons, if I write out the 30 times tables, I've got 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, and I could carry on. For pencils, I've got 24, 48, 72, 96, 120, and I could carry on. But what's common to both is this 120. So we require 120 balloons and 120 pencils. And what we can do now is find out how many packs of balloons we require and how many boxes of pencils we require. So we have 1, 2, 3, four packs of balloons and we have one, two, three, four, five boxes of pencils. So we have four packs of balloons, five boxes of pencils. Question number six. A company orders a large number of plates from a factory. It would take 30 hours to make all the plates using four machines. How many machines are needed to make all the plates in six hours? So, it takes 30 hours to make all the plates using four machines. We can find out how many hours it will take for one machine. So, if we divide by four on the right hand side, we have to multiply by four on the left hand side. 30 multiplied by four is 120. So, it will take 120 hours for one machine to produce all the plates. We are required to find out how many machines are needed to make all the plates in six hours. So, if I divide 120 by 20, I get six. So on the left hand side, if I divide by six, on the right hand side, I need to multiply by 20, leaving me with 20 machines. So it takes 6 hours for 20 machines to produce all of the plates. Question number 7. Riley travelled 
by car and by aeroplane. He travelled 143 miles by car at an average speed of 50 miles per hour. Raleigh then travelled for 5 hours 20 minutes by aeroplane. Work out in hours and minutes Raleigh's total travelling time. So, we can find out how long it takes to travel by car. That's equal to 143 miles divided by 55 miles per hour. So if I do 143 divided by 55... I get 2.6. So we have 2.6 hours. I want to convert this into hours and minutes. Well, clearly, I've got 2 hours and then I've got 0.6 hours. And this 0.6 hours I can convert into minutes by multiplying by 60. So the 0.6 hours is 36 minutes. So 2 hours and 36 minutes is the total time taken to travel by car. So the total travelling time, that's 5 hours 20 minutes, which is the time by aeroplane, plus 2 hours 36 minutes, which is the time travelled in a car. That's equal to a total of 7 hours 56 minutes. Question number 8. The diagram shows a solid cube placed on a horizontal table. The pressure on the table due to the cube is 3.5 newtons per centimetre squared. The force exerted by the cube on the table is 504 newtons. Show that the total surface area of the cube is less than 900 centimetres squared. So, we know that pressure equals force over area. So I've got 3.5 newtons per centimetre squared equals 504 newtons over the area. So to find out the area, that's equal to 504 newtons divided by 3.5 newtons per centimetre squared. So 504 divided by 3.5, that's 144. So the area is 144 centimetre squared. That's the area of each face. So the total surface area is 144 centimetre squared multiplied by 6, because I've got 6 faces, and that's equal to 864 centimetres squared. And clearly, this is less than the 900 centimetres squared. Hence, we've shown this to be true. Question number 9. The line L is shown on the grid. That's what we see here. We have to find an equation for L. The first thing we are required to do is find out the gradient. And the gradient is found by working out the change in Y of the change in X. The change in y is negative 3 and the change in x is 1.5. So the gradient is negative 3 over 1.5, which is negative 2. We are now required to find the y-intercept. That's where the line L crosses the y-axis. And it crosses the y-axis here at the point 3. So the equation of the line L is y equals negative 2x plus 3. Question number 10. Make m the subject of k equals p plus 2m over 5. Our first step is to subtract p from both sides. So I have k subtract p equals 2m over 5. Our next step is to multiply both sides by 5. So I have 5 multiplied by k subtract p equals 2m. Our next step is to divide both sides by 2. That leaves us with 5 lots of k subtract p over 2 equals m. So m equals 5 lots of k subtract p over 2. Question number 11. The floor plan of a house is drawn using a scale of 1 to 50. On the plan, a room in the house has a floor area of 48 centimetres squared. We have to work out the real area of the floor in this room. Give your answer in metres squared. Well, if I've got the scale of 1 to 50, that tells me that the length scale factor is 50, so the area scale factor is 50 squared. So for the real area, that's equal to 48 centimetres squared multiplied by 50 squared. If I work this out, I get 120,000 centimetres squared. And to find out what this is in metres squared, what I need to do is divide this 120,000 by 100 squared to find out what it is in metres squared. So if I divide this by 100 squared, 
you will find the real area is 12 meters squared. Question number 12. The diagram shows a shaded set to P or Q of a circle with center O and radius 6.2 centimeters. The area of the shaded sector is 82.6 cm squared. Calculate the size of angle X. Give your answer correct to three significant figures. So, we have a fraction of an entire circle. The fraction of the entire circle we have is X over 360. So, we multiply this fraction by the area of a full circle, that's pi multiplied by radius, 6.2 squared, and this is equal to the area of the sector 82.6 and we are required to find x. So we have x equals 360 multiplied by 82.6 over pi multiplied by 6.2 squared. So if I work out what this is equal to, I have 360 multiplied by 82.6 over pi multiplied by 6.2 squared, so that's 246.23, etc. To three sig figures, that's 246 degrees. Question number 13. Alan grew 80 plants of the same type outside. The cumulative frequency graph shows information about the heights in centimetres of these plants. That's what we see here. One of the plants is chosen at random. Part A, find an estimate for the probability that this plant will have a height greater than 90 centimetres. Now 90 centimetres is here. If I draw a line up from 90 and then read across, what we have is 74. So the number of plants that have a height greater than 90 is this difference here which corresponds to 6. So the probability will equal 6 over 80 which simplifies to 3 over 40. So the probability is 3 over 40. Part B. Use the graph to find an estimate for the median height. So halving the 80 we get 40. So if I draw a line from 40 and then read down you will find we have a median of 60. Part C. Use the graph to find an estimate for the interquartile range of the heights. So, to find the interquartile range, I need the lower quartile and the upper quartile. So, for the lower quartile, a quarter of 80 is 20, so if I read across from 20 and read down, I get 40. So my lower quartile is 40. For the upper quartile, 20 multiplied by 3, in other words, 3 quarters of 80, that's 60. So if I read across from 60 and read down, I get 75. So my upper quartile is 75. So the interquartile range is the difference between these. 75 subtract 40 is 35. So the interquartile range is 35. Alan also grew plants of the same type inside. The interquartile range of the heights of these plants is 30 centimetres. Part D, give one comparison between the distribution of the heights of the plants grown inside with the distribution of the heights of the plants grown outside. So, I know that the interquartile range of the plants grown inside is 30 centimetres. And if I compare this with the 35, this 30 is smaller. So the inside plants have more consistent heights and that's because the 35 is greater than the 30. So the reason they have a more consistent height is because the interquartile range of the inside plants are smaller. Question number 14. Here are the first six terms of a quadratic sequence. 5, 11, 21, 35, 53 and 75. We have to find an expression in terms of n for the nth term of this sequence. So, the first thing we can do is find the difference between each of these terms. Difference between 5 and 11 is 6. Difference between 11 and 21 is 10. Difference between 21 and 35 is 14. Difference between 35 and 53 is 18. Difference between 53 and 75 is 22. We now need to find the difference between these terms. 
Difference between 6 and 10 is 4. Difference between 10 and 14 is 4. Difference between 14 and 18 is 4. Difference between 18 and 22 is 4. This difference is consistent. So to find the coefficient of n squared, we need to do 4 divided by 2, which is 2. So now, if I write out the n squared terms, just the square numbers, I've got 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, and 36. So the 2n squared terms, we have to multiply each of these by 2. 1 times 2 is 2. 4 times 2 is 8. 9 times 2 is 18. 16 times 2 is 32. 25 times 2 is 50. 36 times 2 is 72. If I write out the sequence, I've got 5, 11, 21, 35, 53, and 75. We now have to work out the sequence subtract the 2n squared terms. So 5 subtract 2 is 3, 11 subtract 8 is 3, 21 subtract 18 is 3, 35 subtract 32 is 3, 53 subtract 50 is 3, 75 subtract 72 is 3. If I now find out the difference between each of these, difference between 3 and 3 is 0, as we see here. So to find the coefficient of n, you will recognize we have 0n. Now, to find the constant term, I need to do this 3 subtract 0, which is 3. So the quadratic sequence is given by 2n squared plus 3. Question number 15. The diagram shows triangle ABC and triangle AED. You have to show that triangle ABC and triangle AED are similar. Now, if I draw out triangle AED, that's this triangle here. I've got AED. AE is 21.6. AD is 32. And if I draw the triangle ABC, well, AB, that's 54, because 32 plus 22 is 54. And AC, that's 80, because 21.6 plus 58.4 is 80. So now we can find the scale factors. If I do 80 divided by 32, that's 2.5. And if I do 54 divided by 21.6, that's also 2.5. And I've also got the angle A here, which is common to both. So both triangles share angle A, and the sides have a common scale factor, which means the triangles are similar. Question number 16. Zia has to set a four-digit security passcode on her phone. Each digit of the passcode is a number from 1 to 9. She can use each number more than once. Zia tells her friend Amber that the first digit is a cube number, the second digit is a prime number, the third digit is greater than 6, the fourth digit is an odd number. The diagram shows one possible four-digit passcode, 1383. Amber is going to have one attempt at guessing Zia's passcode, Work out the probability that Amber guesses Zia's passcode on the first attempt. So, we can have the numbers from 1 to 9. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. For the first digit, we know that's a cube number. The only ones that are cube numbers here, well, I've got 1 cubed, which is 1, and I've got 2 cubed, which is 8. So I've got two outcomes here. For the second, that's a prime number. So, 1 is not a prime number, 2 is a prime number, 3 is a prime number, the 5 is a prime number, and the 7 is a prime number. So here I've got 4 outcomes. For the third, I've got something which is greater than 6, so that's just going to be the 7, 8, or the 9. So here I've got 3 outcomes, and 
for the fourth, I've got an odd number. So I've got one, three, five, seven, and nine. So here I've got five outcomes. So the total number of combinations, that's two multiplied by four, multiplied by three, multiplied by five, which is 120. So the probability that Amber guesses Zia's passcode on the first attempt is one over 120. Question number 17. Part A. For the first part, you have to write x squared subtract 8x plus 3 in the form x subtract a all squared subtract b, where a and b are integers. So I've got x squared subtract 8x plus 3. And if I complete the square to write it in this form, well, halving the negative 8, I get negative 4. So I have x subtract 4 all squared. And then I need to subtract the square of 4 and then add 3 to this result. So I've got x subtract 4 all squared, and I've got negative 16 plus 3, which is negative 13. So x squared subtract 8x plus 3 is equivalent to x subtract 4 all squared subtract 13. For the next part, hence, write down the coordinates of the turning point on the graph of y equals x squared subtract 8x plus 3. Well, if I have x subtract 4, my x coordinate will be positive 4, and the y coordinate will be negative 13. So the turning point has coordinates for negative 13. Part B, solve 7x squared plus 8x subtract 5 equals 0. Give your solutions correct to three significant figures. Well, one way in which we can solve this is to use the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula is given by x equals negative b plus minus the square root of b squared subtract 4ac over 2a. I've got a which is 7, b which is 8, and c which is negative 5. So x is equal to negative 8 plus minus the square root of 8 squared subtract 4 multiplied by 7 multiplied by negative 5 all over 2 times by 7. So let's work out what this is using our calculator. I've got negative 8 plus the square root of 8 squared subtract 4 times 7 times negative 5 over 2 times by 7. So that's 0 0.4487 etc. And for the other value we change this to a minus so I get negative 1.5916 etc. So to three significant figures I've got 0 0.449 and negative 1.59 as my solutions. Alex has to find the solutions of the quadratic equation 3k squared plus 10k subtract a equals 0. Here is his working and answer. So they've got 3k subtract 2, lots of k plus 4 equals 0. And then they've got k equals 2 and k equals negative 4. What mistake has Alex made? Well, let's quickly check the expansion. 3k multiplied by k, that's 3k squared. Then I've got 3k multiplied by 4, subtract 2, multiplied by k, that's 10k. Then I've got negative 2 multiplied by 4, which is negative 8. So the factorization is correct. Now, if I have k plus 4 equals 0, that means k equals negative 4, so that's fine. Now, the problem is over here, if I've got the 3k subtract 2 equaling 0, that means k is equal to 2 thirds. Here they've got k equals 2. So that's what the mistake is. They've solved this bracket incorrectly. Question number 18. I've got triangle P here on this grid. Part A. Enlarge triangle P by scale factor negative 1.5 with centre of enlargement negative 2, negative 1. Label your image Q. So, I've got my centre of enlargement at negative 2, negative 1. And if I think about this point here, I go 2 down and 4 across. So from this point, I have to go 6 this way and then 3 down. 
that takes me to this point here. And if I think about this point here, I go 6 across and then 6 down. So from here, multiplying that by 1.5, I have to go from here, 9 across and then 9 down. That takes me to this point here. And then if I think about this point here, I go 2 down, 6 across. So if I multiply that by 1.5, I have to go 9 across and then 3 down. That takes me to this point here. So now I can form triangle Q as shown here. Triangle P is transformed by a combined transformation of a rotation of 90 degrees anti-clockwise about the origin, followed by a translation to give triangle R. Exactly one vertex of triangle P is invariant under the combined transformation. Part B, find one possible column vector for the translation. So the first thing I'm going to do is rotate triangle P 90 degrees anti-clockwise about the origin. That leaves me with this triangle here. Ah, so from P to R, essentially I've got two transformations going on. One of them is a rotation 90 degrees anti-clockwise about the origin, and the other one is a translation. Now, if I label the points of this triangle A, B, and C, and the points of this triangle A dash, B dash, and C dash, to find a possible column vector for the translation, well, if A is invariant, I'm going to go from A dash to A. If B is invariant, I'm going to go from B dash to B. And if C is invariant, I'm going to go from C dash to C. So, for example, I'm going to go from B dash to B. And if I work out what that vector is, how many do I go to the left? I'll go 1, 2, 3, 4. Five, six, seven. And how many do I go up? Well, I'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I've got minus seven, nine as one possible column vector. Question number 19. The diagram above shows a frustrum F of a cone. The first room is made by removing a cone with height 10 cm from a solid cone with height 15 cm and base diameter 24 cm. Solid S is made by removing F from a solid hemisphere as shown in the diagram below. The hemisphere has a diameter 24 cm. Calculate the volume of solid S. Give your answer correct to three significant figures. Notice how this cone and this hemisphere have the same diameter of 24. So, the first thing we'll do is we'll draw out the larger cone. Now, for the larger cone, we've got the diameter of 24 and the height of 15. And then for this smaller cone, I've got a height of 10. So, I can find out a scale factor by doing 15 divided by 10, which is 1.5. So if I do 24 divided by 1.5, I can find out the diameter of this small cone. So that's 16, as shown here. We can now use this to find out the volume of the frustrum. So, the volume of the frustrum is equal to the big cone subtract the small cone. So for the big cone, I've got a third times pi times 12 squared, remember 12 is the diameter, multiplied by the height of 15. And I subtract from this the small cone, so that's a third times pi times 8 squared times 10. Here the radius is half of 16, which is 8. So let's find out what this is equal to. I've got pi over 3, and then here I've got 12 
squared multiplied by 15 subtract 8 squared multiplied by 10 so I get 1591.74 etc centimeters cubed so the volume of this solid that's found by the hemisphere subtract the frustrum so the volume of the solid that's equal to the volume of the hemisphere which is a half times four thirds times pi times by radius cubed so the radius here is 12 and then I cube it and then I subtract from this the volume of the frustrum 1,591.74 etc. So if I do one half multiplied by four thirds multiplied by pi multiplied by 12 cubed and subtract from this this 1,591.74 etc. I get 2,027. 37 etc centimeters cubed which to three significant figures is 2030 centimeters cubed question number 20 the turning point on the graph of y equals g of x has coordinates negative 3 6 part a write down the coordinates of the turning point on the graph of y equals g of x subtract 7 well if I transform the graph of g of x by means of translation with vector 7, 0, that's represented by y equals g of x subtract 7. Which means what I need to do to the x coordinates is add 7. So the x coordinates given by negative 3 plus 7, which is 4. So the coordinates of the turning point of y equals g of x subtract 7, that will be given by 4. The y coordinate remains the same as 6. So the turning point has coordinates for 6. The graph of y equals f of x is shown on the grid. Part b. On the grid, sketch the graph of y equals f of negative x plus 3. So here is y equals f of x. And the first thing I'm going to do is reflect it in the y-axis because I've got y equals f of negative x. So here, if I reflect this in the y-axis, I get this graph here. And then I need to move this graph three units up. So I've got one unit up, two units up, three units up. As we see here. So this is the graph of y equals f of negative x plus three. Question number 21. A, B, C and D are points on the circumference of a circle with center O. A, C is the diameter of the circle. A, D, E and B, C, E are straight lines. You have to work out the size of the angle B, C, D. Write down any circle theorems I use. First of all, the angle ADC is 90 degrees because angles in a semicircle is 90. So this angle is 90. And if this angle is 90, we can find out the angle CDE. The angle CDE is also 90 because I've got angles on a straight line. So I've got the 90 degrees here. Now I've got this triangle DCE. I've got two angles, I can find this missing angle of DCA. The angle DCA is equal to 180, subtract this 28, subtract this 90, and that's because angles in a triangle sum to 180. So I get 62 degrees, as shown here. I can now find out the angle BCD by using angles in a straight line. So BCD is equal to 180 subtract 62, and that's because angles on a straight line sum to 180. So BCD is 118, as shown here. So the next thing I can do is find out the angle DBC, recognizing it's equal to the angle DAC, and that's because of the alternate segment theorem. 
So the angle DCB is 32 degrees because of the alternate segment theorem. So let's add this to the diagram. Now we are required to find the size of the angle BDC. So the size of the angle BDC, well, I've got a triangle here. I've got this angle given, this angle given. So the angle BDC is 180 subtract 118 subtract 32 because angles in a triangle sum to 180. And working that out, I get 27. So this angle is 27. And that's the angle we are required to find. Question number 22. Ebony makes some bracelets to sell. The materials to make all the bracelets cost £190, correct to the nearest £5. Ebony sells all the bracelets for a total of £875, correct to the nearest £5. The total time taken to make and sell all these bracelets was 72 hours, correct to the nearest hour. Ebony uses this method to calculate her hourly rate of pay. The hourly rate of pay is equal to the total selling price subtract the total cost of materials over the total time taken. The minimum hourly rate of pay for someone of Ebony's age is £8.20. By considering bounds, determine if Ebony's hourly rate of pay was definitely more than £8.20. You must show all your working. Well, if we're considering bounds, let's find the upper and lower bounds of the materials, the selling prices and the times. So, for the materials, if we're giving it to the nearest £5, the upper bound is £192.50, the lower bound is £197.50. For the selling price, that's £875, correct, to the nearest £5. So, for the selling prices, the upper bound is 877.5 and the lower bound is 872.5. And for the time, that's 72 hours to the nearest hour. So for the time, the upper bound is 72.5 hours and the lower bound is 71.5 hours. Now what do we need to do? What we need to do is find out the hourly rate of pay and in doing so we need to consider the lower bound of the pay because we're comparing it to the minimum hourly rate of pay of £8.20 which is why we need to find the lower bound of pay. We want the lower bound to be as small as possible so how do we get a small value here? Well the numerator needs to be as small as possible and the denominator needs to be as big as possible. So for that to happen, I need the lower bound of the selling and I need to subtract from this the upper bound of materials. This gives a small difference and I divide all this by the upper bound of time. This would give me the lower bound of pay. So what is the lower bound of selling? That's £872.50. What's the upper bound of materials? That's £192.50. What's the upper bound of time? That's 72.5 hours. So I've got £872.50 subtract £192.50 all over £72.50. So let's work this out. 872.50 subtract 192.50 over 72.50. Two decimal places we get £9.38. Now if I compare this with the £8.20 we see that this value is certainly bigger. So is her hourly rate of pay more? Yes it is. So her pay was more. Question number 23. Given that 2x squared plus y squared over 4x squared subtract y squared equals 43 over 11, where x is greater than 0 and y is greater than 0, we have to find in its simplest form the ratio of x to y. What we need to do here is cross multiply. So I've got the 11 multiplied by the 
2x squared plus y squared equals the 43 multiplied by the 4x squared subtract y squared. I need to find x to y in its simplest form. So, for me to do that, well, let's expand the brackets. 11 times 2x squared is 22x squared. 11 times y squared is 11y squared. And this is equal to 43 times 4x squared, which is 172x squared. And 43 times negative y squared is negative 43y squared. If I gather everything with a y on one side and everything with an x on the other side, in terms of my y squareds, I've got 54 of them. And in terms of my x squareds, I've got 150 of them. So 54y squared equals 150x squared. If I divide both sides by 6, I've got 9 minus squared equals 25x squared. And if I square root both sides, I end up with 3y equals 5x. And now if I find the fraction y over x, so I divide both sides by x, and then divide both sides by 3, you will find y over x to equal 5 over 3, which means x to y is equal to 3 to 5. Question number 24. The diagram shows a triangular prism with a horizontal rectangular base ABCD. M is the midpoint of AD. The vertex T of the prism is vertically above M. AB is 14.7 centimeters, so that's this entire length here. BC is equal to 3.8 centimeters, and MT is equal to 2.3 centimeters. P is the point on AB such that AP to PB is 5 to 2. We have to calculate the size of the angle between TP and the base ABCD of the prism. Give your answer correct to one decimal place. So here I've amended the diagram. I've got AP to PB being in the ratio 5 to 2. And I'm required to find the angle between TP and the base ABCD. And that's shown in orange here. So, let's see what we can figure out so far. I know MT is 2.3 centimetres. I've got BC being 3.8 centimetres, and if M is the midpoint of AD, halving the three point eight, I get 1.9. So, MA is 1.9 centimetres. To find out what AP is, that's equal to, using the ratio, 5 sevenths of 14.7 centimetres. So if I do 14.7 divided by 7 and then multiply by 5, I get 10.5. So I have 10.5 centimetres, and that's the length AP. What I can find out is the length MP. So the length MP is equal to the square root of 10.5 squared plus 1.9 squared. That's just simple Pythagoras. That will help me find out what MP is. So I've got the square root of 10.5 squared plus 1.9 squared, which is 10.67, etc. centimetres. And that's shown there. So I need to find out this angle. I've got the opposite, I've got the adjacent, so I need to use tan. So the tan of TPM is equal to 2.3 over 10.67. So I can find out what the angle TPM is. So I've got the inverse tangent of 2.3 over this value here, which is 12.16 etc. degrees to one decimal place. I've got 12.2 degrees.